So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is sort of give an overview of what we've done at the Genetic Center relative to Excellent MR and what we plan to do to sort of uh, complete the last mile um, because we've spent a lot of effort on this. So just to remind you all why we were interested in Excellent you know, uh, Intellectual Disability and that's because um, the male to female ratio, regardless of whether we look in South Carolina or around the world, it's always in, a, in about um, 1.2 to 1.3, so which indicates that there's an excess of males in the uh, population with intellectual disability relative to females. And this has been noted since 1933 with Penrose. So it's a consistent finding over a long period of time. And we took that when I uh, came here <clears throat> in 1985 to mean that there are a lot of genes on the X chromosome related to intellectual disability. Families with X linkage are easier to work with than families with autosomal inheritance. And so we instituted a strong program in identifying genes associated with X-linked intellectual disability. So <clears throat> about this time and, and in talking with other people throughout the world, we decided as a group that there would be a delineation of X-linked ID into two <coughs> subpopulations. One would be syndromal X-linked ID, and this would be a pedigree with X-linkage that had either dis distinctive cranial facial appearance or growth aberrations, either tall stature, short stature, malformations, uh, neuromuscular findings, uh, behavioral abnormalities, or metabolic disturbances. It's something that would distinguish the affected male in the family from the unaffected siblings or from the population in general. And then you would have the non-syndromal X-linked ID families, and these would be families with a clear indication of X inheritance, but there would be no other findings in the affected males that would separate them from their siblings or anybody else in the population. And this is a rough uh, delineation which actually can change as you identify the causation in the family. So for example, the family that was originally described by Snyder Robinson in 1969 as a family with non-syndromic, non-specific excellent ID actually is Snyder Robinson syndrome because they have a defect in <clears throat> uh, spermine synthase synthesis and you now have a biochemical marker that distinguishes the, one, the affected males from the unaffected males as well as the fact that on further clini uh, clinical evaluation they have some other findings. They have osteoporosis, they have skeletal abnormalities, and uh, low muscle mass. So that family with further study actually moved from being a non-syndromal <laughs> to a syndromal. So the delineation between non-syndromal and syndromal gets a little problematic. Well, the identification of genes on the X associated with X-linked ID has gone through a transition of the of the methodologies that have been used to identify it. So initially, the, the low-hanging fruit were those genes that were associated with known pathways, usually metabolic conditions. So you had HPRT, OTC, uh, PGK, or they were known associated with a known pathway like PLP. And then people took advantage of your X autosomal translocations in patients with Phenotype. So this is how the DMV gene was identified, the Norris gene, and the Arstad gene were identified this way by taking advantage of patients with translocation breakpoints uh, and the assumption being that the breakpoint on the X interrupted the gene on the X that was responsible for the phenotype. And then when we started to do linkage analysis, and you, then you could identify a localization on the X and you could do candidate gene testing of genes that were available at that time that were localized to the, to the region of interest. And this is how L1CAM, ATRX, 
uh, the Clofalauri gene RSK2 were identified. And then we progressed to X chromosome sequencing, and a lot of genes were identified. I just list uh, a couple of the three that were done originally. Then you have genomic microarray, which picks up deletions and duplications, and that's how the UE1 was identified. And then you have an expression array, which actually had not been as productive as we would like, and very few genes were identified that way. And this is just a map that we prepared for a review back in 2012, indicating the progression of the utilization of these different approaches. And you'll see that the X sequencing has really came into play around 2005, 2006. And a lot of genes were identified this way. And as I said, the expression array has been limited in, in its identification of genes. So you're still left to X sequencing or sequencing of genes in the candidate region. Nonetheless, this has been extremely successful. And I could have taken a lot of time by going through a time-lapse photography here showing how the X chromosome evolved from just having four or five genes on it when we started in 1990 to what it is now, which has over 110 genes. And this lists all of the genes that are associated with known syndromes. However, there still exists a lot of excellent ID syndromal uh, conditions that are listed here that do not have a gene associated with them. And so this sort of highlights the problem because a lot of these families have been tested for the candidate genes in the linkage region and they're still negative. Or uh, unfortunately, some of the families have never really been tested, but the majority of these have already been looked at and have found, been found to be without a gene. You can make the same plot for non-syndromal X-linked ID. And so you have here the genes that are associated with the <coughs> non-syndromal uh, forms of uh, X-linked ID, and some of these are associated with syndromal. Uh, excellent ID. So ATRX is associated with um, a non-syndromal uh, form. RSK2 is associated with a family that has non-syndromal excellent ID. And this becomes a problem when you try to sort this out. And again, over here, all of the families in the literature with a linkage greater than 2 to the X chromosome, the bars delineate the localization limits. And again, for the majority of these families, they have been tested for the genes over here and have not been, I, I, you know, gene has not been associated. So at, the, at least at the genetic center, we've been responsible for the identification of 24 genes associated with excellent uh, ID syndromes. And the first one being found in 1994 and the last one we put published the last, this year, 2016, and seven non-syndromal entities, the first one being uh, published in 1999, and the last one that we've been able to be successful with is, was published in 2006. So the dilemma that we have is that mutations in a single gene can give rise to either syndromal or non-syndromal form. So you have the problem of you have a, a person who comes in, a male, non-syndromic, excellent ID, and you sort of are biased not to test that person for the gene for a syndrome because he doesn't present with the syndrome, but in fact, he actually may have a variant in that gene that results in the intellectual disability. The mutation rate is quite low for most of these genes, which means you want, it may be a good candidate gene for excellent ID, but if you if you don't, if your cohort is not large enough, you're not going to pick up that one family that might give you the hint that that gene is responsible. And, as we'll cover in the last couple of slides, many of these entities remain unresolved, which is what we're going to try to approach now. So the unresolved disorders, there's 57 <coughs> excellent ID syndromes that are out there that do not have a gene associated with them. We have 19 of them here at the GGC, and we've requested from our colleagues another 13 for analysis. 
there are 34 X-linked ID non-syndromic entities that are out there. We have 11 here at GGC, and we've requested another four. And then we actually have 28 other families that have good indication of X linkage that we've not published. Uh, they can be either syndromic or non-syndromic. We just haven't published them, but we have good indication that um, some of them have good localization data, some do not because the, the family history could be good, but the number of samples that we have access to don't allow us to actually do localization. And so we are looking at trying to work with these 60 or so entities. And the approach that we're going to try to take is outlined here. So if we have genomic DNA, they will go through a microarray, the, one that, the most current one that we have available. We will also do whole genome sequencing because a lot of these have had some X exome sequencing and have been negative and data suggests that if you do a whole genome sequencing approach you might actually find something that you missed by whole exome. It will be easy or easier to look at the gene domains and I call those domains because you're looking at the five prime UTR, the gene which will include the introns and the exons as well as the 3 prime UTR, and we are developing a pipeline uh, in conjunction with Jeff Twist down at USC to an uh, annotate and interrogate the variants in the 3 prime UTR regions, particularly in genes that are in the localization region that we have if we haven't identified a good candidate variant. At the same time, we are developing pipelines to really uh, interrogate the non-coding region. The, the long non-coding RNA, the microRNA, to determine if variants in those actually have some relevance to the expression of the gene involved. For those that we have a cell line on, we will do RNA-seq, and this would hopefully inform some of the non-coding variants that we have because we may see the lack of expression of the gene in the cell line, and we don't see any change in the coding or the gene domain, so you then look at the non-coding area around that gene. Maybe there's a variant that we picked up that might be relevant to affecting the expression of the gene. The other thing is we will, as I will show in the next couple of slides, we will go back to the future and do a flow sort to separate the X chromosome which will then be, uh, we will do whole genome sequencing on a fraction of DNA that's been enriched for the X chromosome to increase the coverage of the X, it allows us a deeper read on the whole genome sequencing and hopefully pick up some variants that way that would be missed on a regular uh, whole genome sequencing. So again, we will uh, look at the gene domains and the non-coding regions. And most of you are wondering, how do you flow sort a chromosome? Because you're all used to doing cell sorting. But we're going back to something that, was, that I worked on uh, in conjunction with the group of Joel Gray, looking at the content of uh, the DNA from abnormal chromosomes, uh, abnormal X chromosomes, and when we were looking at trying to clone the X, the fragile X locus, we were trying to isolate the X chromosome from fragile X people as well as women who had terminal deletions of the X chromosome and they were doing a flow sort at that time and in fact all of the initial chromosome specific libraries that were used for cloning and identifying genes were created using this methodology where you can separate the chromosomes by a flow sort and depending on what fraction you collected it would be enriched for the chromosome of interest. And you'll see this is where the X is sorted. And it's, it's going to be contaminated a little bit with seven and eight in here, but you've eliminated all of these other chromosomes. And it's been difficult to actually go back to the future because people have moved beyond this. And a lot of the machines that do cell sorting aren't amenable to this. But fortunately, there's a machine in, in MUSC 
and someone who's actually interested in appro approaching this that found this uh, idea intriguing, and we've been working with him uh, down at MUSC named uh, Jacob Kendrick. And we've been able to do a couple of flow sorts at UM, uh, MUSC, and we've looked at two patients, and we've been able to collect material in the region that we predict would have the X chromosome excluding all of the material here. And this, so now you get to see what real data looks like in a lab. So this is a gel electrophoresis, and uh, what Melanie May did in the lab is we have a gene of our interest, the ZC4H2, that we published this year. Uh, as an excellent ID gene, and we had primers, so we said, do, let's just see if we can amplify an exon or two from this gene, from the material that we sorted. And so this bright band here is because we just want to make sure the primers work, so this is genomic DNA overloaded. This is the collection of material before we did the flow sort. This is after the flow sort. This is what we collected as the X containing fraction, and this is the fraction that was not collected as an expert that came off the flow sort machine. You can see there's an visually an enrichment. We have to quantitate this. That was one patient. Here's the other patient. This is the X collected material. This is the other material. And again, you can see we've enriched for this gene, or at least the, um, the band is consistent. And then, of course, we sequenced the band, and indeed it is from ZC4H2. We used as another uh, gene, CHV8, from chromosome 14, just to show that we can actually identify another gene in this flow sort material. So at the end, we are going to do, if it's genomic DNA, we're doing the standard. If we have a cell line, we will take this approach to try to enrich for the X chromosome material. It's a trip back to the future, and we hope that this will help solve a lot of the families that we have in house. So as we usually, as Roger and I usually do when we end a talk on excellent ID, we leave you with two comments from Jill Turner. Her first comment was published back in 1990, uh, and probably still holds to some degree. That any male with intellectual disability for which you cannot identify the cause, you should assume it's an excellent gene that's involved. And the second one from 1996, that every male in this room should remember that his son's intelligence, if that's important to him, is dependent on his partner or the son's mother, not on him. Keep that in mind. And then lastly, a lot of what we do here, we've been successful, but we're successful because not only the people at the Greenwood Genetic Center, but all of the people across the world that provide us with families and material because we're sort of recognized as the ex one of the excellent ID centers in the world. So, thank you.